My gosh, you boys already know I'm not letting that Ramsey boy come over and play until you clean up your rooms. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's cousin, Diana. Today, we'll dive deep into one famous writer's thoughts about money with the bitches get riches, ladies, Kitty and Piggy. Hi. Plus, our own Mr. Howell, OG. And finally, the man who played the title role in Gilligan's Island, it's... Wait, he's dead. It's just the very much alive. I think, anyway, is he moving? Yes, it is, Len Penzo. But that's not all. Halfway through the show, I'll share my faraway trivia question. And now, a guy who's the skipper to my captain, it's Joe Salcihai. Hey everybody, welcome to Gilligan's Island Reprise Week on the show. I am Joe Saul C. I. and what a start, Diet and Miriam. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? I am uh, ready to be the skipper of this podcast because we have a fine crew, as you know. Absolutely. Great crew. Let's meet them. First of all, the guy sitting across the card table from me is always Mr. OG's here. Were you a big Gilligan's Island fan back in the day? Watch the reruns? I was going to say, that's, you know, on the edge of like old person talking. So I, I'm aware that Gilligan's Island existed. There's a whole bunch of people listening to this going, well, who the hell is what? You and Len probably saw the, 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 the initial, what's it, what's it called? The pilot. You guys probably watched the pilot on uh, ABC or whatever. It was I on. don't know. But, uh, Let's ask him. The guy deep under Los Angeles in his bunker, as usual, Mr. Len Penzo's here. Len, you uh, did you watch the pilot of Gilligan's Island? I didn't know there was a pilot on the island. I thought there was a skipper and <laughs> yeah. there was Gilligan, but uh, maybe I missed that. It doesn't get oh, better gee, than I'm, this. I'm it not, does not so get sure. better. <laughs> yeah. How are you, Mr. Penzo? Well, you know, uh, you know, I just, I just had my 60th birthday, and I know, um, Joe, crap. you're a little younger than me, but uh, it was kind of traumatic. Significantly younger. I've been reflecting, and you know, I used to think I was indecisive, but uh, now I'm not so sure. Oh my god! <laughs> what? <laughs> and it's still and and Thank wondering you. what Thank the you. hell they're doing here. <laughs> They have not been with us since uh, the Diana Your Economy Conference where we did our live show. We've got the Bitches Get Riches ladies back. The the blog that I have said over and over is not aimed at me, but is my favorite blog on earth by far. Piggy and Kitty here. How are you, ladies? We are ready for this three-hour tour. <laughs> I mean, we do have our agent on the phone complaining that we're here. But yeah, if we get a better offer, we're out. We're out. We like we're already in it. We already put clothes on, so we're here. We're ready. <laughs> well, and just so people know the voices, because this is th there's two of you playing on Team Paula Pant this week, since she couldn't be here. Let's uh, let's let's do the voices so everybody knows in audio land. Kitty, how are you? I am Kitty, and I want to be the Pant in the Paula Pant. <laughs> and then the Paula in the Paula Pant is Piggy. Yes, I am uh, the Paula in this Paula pant. I am Piggy. Uh, we are the bitches and bitches get riches. Uh, Piggy and Kitty, last time you guys regaled us with your theme song on Diana's this economy stage. That was fantastic. I was surprised your agent wasn't talking to you more about that, about like going on tour with Taylor Swift. You know, we had offers, but at the end, we just felt that there wasn't quite synergy between our brands. You know, tons of uh, respect and admiration for Taylor and what she's doing, but, you know, we needed to, to go our own way. I'm so glad you used the word synergy because it's my least favorite word, and so I try to use it constantly. I really appreciate You're it. You're welcome. You're welcome. And, and and we were on stage together at Economy. Diana, how's the, uh, the Economy Conference? I can't believe it's next weekend. How's uh, How are tickets looking? It's funny because I see an email come through. I shouldn't be paying attention to this, but uh, nice. glad you're here with us, Diana. <laughs> two more tickets literally just sold. So it's very exciting. Yes. Uh, uh, if you go to economy.com slash economy .com and the code is stacking Benjamins, all one word, you get 10% off. If there's any tickets left, those could have been the last two that just sold. Mm -hmm. I, don't know, I can't keep track anymore. 
Who knows? Well, well, everybody's like, when are you getting to it? We'll get to it right now. We've got a piece by the Morgan Housel today that we're going to dive into on spending money. So let's go. We've got Kitty and Piggy here. The bitches are with us. Diana Miriam and Len Penzo. So let's go. While our uh, little intro was playing there, Len, you, you decided that you and OG need to be the bastards then? Yes, I think that's uh, I think that's only appropriate. I feel a little left out. You know, you've got uh, Kitty and Biggie yeah. over here getting their own title. Of course. I want, I want of a course. title, too. Yeah. You with the me? The bitches and the me, bastards. OG? Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah, sure. Whatever, man. <laughs> And so, where does that where does that leave Diana? Piggy, you're gonna you're you're making her an oh. honorary. Oh, yeah. Diana's an honorary bitch. She has been part of our family for quite some time. So, Diana, I've always thought of you as a huge bitch. I've been a bitch my whole life, actually. You know what? She was. <laughs> listen, some people are uh, are born to bitchiness. Some have it thrust upon them. And mm-hmm. Diana, I think we can safely say, was born to it. Thank you. I've been working on my resting bitch face for this recording. So I hope and you all I enjoy think- that. Chef's kiss. Dan, if you want to identify as a bastard, you're you're welcome in our group. No, no, no. No, no, no. We claimed her for hours. She's ours, Len. Back off. I told OG before we started recording how much fun we were going to have. And I was like, I wonder if we're ever going to get to the piece. And I know that's what everybody's thinking right now. This is uh, by the Morgan Housel. He has a few thoughts on spending money, specifically 13. Don't know if he thought about that unlucky number. But uh, Morgan just published this at the end of January, and I found these super interesting. Let's start with just his first one. We're going to walk through a few of these. I'll link to them on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. But you, you truly do not need to read along. Uh, we're going we're gonna to give you everything you need and more. Morgan says this. There are two ways to use money. One is as a tool to live a better life. The other is as a yardstick of status to measure yourself against others. Many people aspire for the former, but get caught up chasing the latter. I don't know. Uh, Kitty, let's start with you. Was there ever a time in your life when you found yourself chasing the admiration of others by spending more money or chasing their love? Well, uh, Joe, first I want to say that I agree that money is a tool, and I would know because I'm a huge tool myself. It's true. Um, I have found. Yes, that for me, money is typically secondary. What I am often chasing is achievement. And those two things so often go hand in hand together. And it's taken me 100% of my life um, and will continue to take me more uh, to figure out what is the difference between an achievement that I really want for myself versus what is an achievement that is me trying to be the best little girl in the world who wants to prove that I am worthy of love, worthy of respect, uh, worthy of the space that I take up uh, in the world. And so I, I really feel that one in that way. Money often comes when you chase achievements, but uh, do you even really need it? Well, it just makes me think, uh, 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 Piggy, that what Kitty's saying, I feel like the internet makes it worse. Like social media makes that even worse, don't you? Oh, absolutely. Hundred hundred percent. And I mean, this is if you have ever wanted to travel or you fo- you follow travel Instagrams or I believe the children are calling it the clock, the, the clock clockity talk app. Uh, TikTok, that's the one. That's the one the kids are on. Uh yeah, if you if you follow those those traveling accounts, it can be really easy to to look around and be like, oh, all these people are taking fabulous European vacations. All these people are spelunking in Asia. Why, why am I not doing that? Clearly, I'm missing out on something. So it can be really easy to derail your own uh, plans and your own sort of purposes that you've set money aside for uh, because you feel like you you should be doing something that you're not. You should be keeping up with the Joneses or uh, in in some ways, living up to these aspirational social media accounts on on that clock clockety clockety app, you know. I think it's possible to have a little bit of both here, where you're using money as a tool to buy your freedom, but it's also a little bit of a flex. So I'll give you an example. I drive a 2010 Mazda three. Like there is no scoreboard flex when it comes to oh. my car. Right. But I had a bumper sticker on the back for a long time that said my other vehicle is a 401k, which is actually a big flex. So I think there's a a fun way to combine the two there. I think it's excellent finance pun, by the way. (laughs) 
I think it's funny how a flex in our community is different. Like my car's got 250,000 miles on it. Bam. <laughs> like it's a whole, whole different type of flex. Len, Len, when you, when you were young, did this, you were young once upon a time, I heard supposedly, did you, did a you find yourself getting caught up in the yardstick of status to measure yourself against other people? No, not at all. I, I've never been impressed by displays of wealth or what or supposed displays of wealth uh, mainly maybe it's because i realized that just because you can flash wealth or you have wealth you are like a flashy car or something that doesn't mean you you're wealthy anyways does it? it it could mean and in many cases it probably means you're just over leveraged yourself with, with debt and you're living paycheck to paycheck to keep that thing on the road and impress people so so for me that's never been an issue with me i've i had a used I bought my very first new car when I was 50 years old, which unbelievably was a decade ago from that, from there. So, um, I've never been, I've never had, I've never, never had that. And, and I, that's fortunate for me, I think, because it sure helped, uh, me save as much as I needed to retire when I did. So how old were you when you retired, Len? I was 58. Had a boy. Thank you. Did you walk uphill both ways with no shoes to uh, retirement? Yeah. <laughs> Was it snowing? <laughs> you know what, folks? Work hard and save your money. That way, when you're old like me, you can uh, buy the things that only young people can enjoy. Like uh, squirrel watching um, yes. cameras yes. and apps, <laughs> which our community can't get enough of. And Kitty and Piggy have no idea that we're not kidding. Len, Len has these cool squirrel watching apps. How dare you think that in my household, we are not the kind of people who go running into the next room to say, oh, my God, there's a blue jay. There's a blue jay. Hurry, run. We've got to see him. <laughs> birds are one thing. I get birds like they're different and they're colorful, but squirrels, kitty, kitty, squirrels. all you need is a camera. If you have a camera, you don't need to run anywhere. You can sit you can sit in your couch and watch TV and then still you know, pick up your phone and see the squirrel or blue jay. You're so right. Shame on me for wanting to burn a calorie. I I, I will consider uh, this an investment in, in my future. Thank you. Well, you see this? We, we got you on the status thing right there, Kitty. Like, if you don't have any status with us, you're going to buy the squirrel cam. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly. Total. I've got to get a squirrel cam. Otherwise, what will the boys think of me? That's I kind it. of imagine Len in this, like, Batman-esque, like, command center with, like, screens <laughs> upon screens of squirrel cams displaying... Please tell me you have a squirrel picnic table, though. We do. Oh, absolutely. Thank God. And I and I wrote on this and I painted on the side of it, it says nuts five cents. So it's really cool in the video, so you can see the. But, the... <laughs> but those bastards don't pay, Len. They don't. Pay. I know. I, well, you know what's funny is I always ask it. They leave. A, they leave. I ask the honey bag. They leave a nickel this time. No, they never. They've never left a nickel yet. It's, it's you know, the honor it, system. The squirrels have no honor. Squirrels We're have in for no like honor. thirty dollars a instead. month in nets for these squirrels. I, I mean, it's it's uh, almost as expensive as a dog. Yeah, this is the road to fire, people. Like you heard it here first. Put yourself a squirrel cam. Spend thirty dollars a month on nuts, and no, you'll is, be at early retirement before you know it. No, piggy, this is the road to a podcast nobody listens to. This, <laughs> this, what, the, what this road is? Welcome to Squirrel Cam Radio. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, gee, and I'm sure you see this all the time is that is that people constantly, I mean, they will tell you when they're in your financial planning office that they want a better life. And yet, when you look at the things they own, it says, I want status. It's like the uh, Maury Povich show, right? Like you, it's like you say that you are the father. The test results show you are not. Right. Or, you know, whatever. You say um, you're interested in retirement. But yeah, however you want to retire, that... but your, your spending pattern suggests that you want to work till you're 93. I think there's a time and a place for all of these experiences and, and kind of this, this the story arc of, I'm surprised, Len, that you said that it's ne it never happened to you. And I suppose that that's, you're, I suppose you're probably in the minority. Um, oh, I'm sure. Vast yes. minority. I sh I'm sure I'm in the minority, yes. But. And he talks about it a little bit later about like different types of money. Like if you came from money or if you came from not having money, that's going to maybe kind of pull you in one direction or another. Um, but we've talked a lot about the transition from things to experiences. And, um, and I think that at, at some level, like you just have enough stuff to, to not actually care about having more stuff. 
but instead you do want to do those things. I stopped going on Instagram because of the Yellowstone Club. If you don't follow Yellowstone Club on Instagram, you're missing out on on FOMO like crazy because it is the most magical place in the world. And Justin Timberlake has a house there, apparently, and Jerry Seinfeld. And you pretty much realize that there's no chance that you'll ever have $30 million to spend on one house. Not not like 30 million total, but just like one house is 30 million. And you're like, holy crap, what what do I what do I not know that ex- doesn't, you know, that exists? Like there's so much out there. It's too much. It's too much. Just do you focus on what's important to you. And if you want to drive a fancy car, drive a fancy car. But don't do it at the at the expense of other financial goals. And I think that's the biggest thing when it comes to you know, comes to planning and kind of doing your thing is that what's what, you know, what I like to do and what I spend money on may be different than what you want to spend money on. And that's totally fine. But as long as you're reaching your financial goals and I'm reaching my financial goals, who gives a crap? You know, uh, up near the top of this piece as well is uh, this uh, quote from Morgan. Money's a tool you can use, but if you're not careful, it will use you. Sometimes the stuff you spend money on is so much influence over your autonomy and sanity that it's not clear whether you own things or the things own you. Piggy, let's start with you on that one, because I immediately thought of some stuff. I'm like, well, how does money own me? Like when you read this, how do you think in what ways can money own you if you're not careful? I thought of one word and that word is burnout. I think a lot of people in the quest to, whether it's to retire early or to achieve some lofty financial goal, they end up burning themselves out for the sake of accumulating money. And we, uh, the, we the bitches, uh, are actually releasing a course this month on burnout, how to identify it, how to manage it, how to uh, make sure it's not ruling your life. But I, I think that that's the biggest way that money can rule you is the mindless accumulation of it with no thought to how you are a, a living, breathing bag of, of blood along the way and that you you have biological needs like sleep and you have emotional needs like uh, rest and relaxation and hobbies and uh, whatever else floats your boat and rubs your Buddha. And I, I think that if we're talking about money ruling us, the biggest thing we need to be worried about is being intentional, uh, intentional not to just run face first into a wall of burnout and stress on our way to to allowing money ruling us. It's funny, Piggy. Uh, we had John Acuff on the show back in mid January, early January. Uh, uh, actually, I take the back first week of January, and I and I asked him about burnout, and and he said this. He's like, people talk about burnout is just doing too much. He said burnout, in his opinion, is burnout is when those actions don't meet your priorities. When when you realize that I'm doing a bunch of stuff, like you, you don't get burnt out doing the crap you like, right? Yeah. You, you get you get burnt out when you're like, I am doing so much stuff and none of this aligns with my goals. And I'm seeing you nod your head. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that, you know, you can you can do things that align with your goals, but there's there's no way that one can, you know, work super, and I say this as somebody who worked super hard to pay off my student loan debt. Like if there were times in that journey when I was so burned out and I was so tired because I was working multiple jobs and I was putting every penny toward my debt, which is exactly what we tell people to do when they're trying to get out of debt. But there came moments where I was just like, you know what, if I spent six dollars on a beer right now like would that really hurt my goals that much not so much but it would help me relax it would you know put me in a position where i am in a place where i have you know nothing to do nowhere to be and i can just socialize and i can just relax or you know spending a couple dollars on a bath bomb or whatever's going to relax you that's not going to set your goals behind that much, but it is going to do a lot for your ability to persevere and your endurance to get through without burning out and then losing way more progress towards your goals. But it's funny though, we did a show a couple of weeks ago where we talked about, you talked about having a beer, not going to hurt you toward your goals, but there are people on the, on the big time, you know, I'm, I'm an overachiever. I'm working in this big organization. I'm trying to climb the corporate ladder that that one beer piggy turns into self-medication. 
And then, mm. and then it totally goes against what you're trying to do. Yeah, I think yeah. that that's totally fair. And I think that there was a time in my life when I was one of those people. And, oh, and I totally Kitty, was. Yeah, it, like Kitty can attest to this. Like we've we've all been there. I think it's it's learning to moderate yourself. Like, do you guys know what Rumspringa is? It's like when all the okay, great, I'm teaching you a new word. This is so fun. So Amish kids. I learned about Rumshaker listening to uh, like uh, what was that rap song in the early '90s? This is a whole different inappropriate. Thing. Inappropriate. inappropriate. Oh, that's, Cut that's that. A different thing. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Slightly different. Slightly different. Uh, no, Rumspringa is what happens when Amish kids are in their late teens and they've grown up um, in this Amish community. They don't have technology. They don't have access to the internet. And their parents say, all right, for the next year, you're going out into the secular world and you're going to do whatever you want for that year. And if, if at the end of the year, you're ready to like come back and live the Amish lifestyle, great. And if not, like also no foul, like go on and, and live in the secular world. And what they find is a lot of these kids who have spent their whole life so restricted, living this very uh, restrictive Amish lifestyle, they go out in the world and they go nuts. They party, they drink, they do all these wild experiences and, and they just have a great time. And then when they come back, they're like, whew, okay, I think I'm ready to buckle down. I think I, I really believe in our lifestyle and I'm ready to get to it. And I, I feel like the concept of Rumspringa is just like, if you bottle something up so much, like you're way more willing to like, like keeping it under pressure, like a bottle of champagne, you pop it and it just like all comes pouring out. So um, the point, and I do have one, is that if we are bottling up all our self-care, all of mm. our little tiny luxuries, like a beer after work or a bubble bath, can you guys tell I really need a bubble bath? Um, if you're like bottling all these up and you're not engaging in even one small form of self-care, you're far more likely to burn out and then like just go nuts with using multiple beers as a coping mechanism or, or self-medicating in some way, which is why you need to sort of engage in this very moderate, very planned, intentional form of relaxation and self-care as you're on your financial journey. Cause you don't want to, you don't want to have your rum spring a moment, uh, and which will totally throw you off your goals. That's wild. I had never, i had never heard of that. And we had Amish like the last country. 25 years has been that for me. <laughs> your rum spring well, a moment. Yes. Yeah, so, so <laughs> 20 years. I'm ready to, I'm ready to buckle down guys. All right. All right. Just maybe one more weekend though. Welcome back, back. OG. <laughs> and then I'll be back. Maybe on Monday. Not sure. It's funny. I love where you took that, Peggy, because that was not at all what what, what, what I was thinking about. Kitty, what, what what when you read this, what what came across your mind for money using when you? I, when I read what? What I read? This, <laughs> we read something. We, 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 there was homework. <laughs> were, we, were we supposed to do this? When you saw that money's a tool you you use, but if you're not careful, it can use you. I was like, what? I didn't think at all what Piggy thought, but I love that. What What did you think? You know, it's interesting. What came to mind for me first was the number of people that I know who have set up a lifestyle where they feel that they are, it, it's necessary for them to spend an awful lot of money um, in order to not provide for themselves, but to provide for everyone around them. I think of the people that I know who um, take on a, a second job that they do on nights and weekends because they want to be able to afford to send their child to private school. Um, and that is the kind of decision that people make because not only is sending their child to the best possible school important to them, but it's part of their identity that I want to live my values. And part of my values is that I'm going to be the best parent that I can be. And I'm going to make sure that my children have every advantage that I'm capable of giving them. Um, but what is so interesting is um, when you see people who really like overcommit to providing um, the best of everything, um, you often end up with like that the consequence of that decision is like that this hypothetical parent then isn't spending that time, those nights and weekends with their child, or maybe they're going to the soccer game, but they're like furiously typing on, well, on a, on a tablet the whole time, which is just so depressing. Spending money instead of spending time. 
Yeah, it it just becomes a trap that like I don't know how to show the world or the people around me what my priorities are unless I'm spending money and time on them. Oftentimes that is how we how we can show that something's important to us. We spend our time and we spend our money on it. Um those are our two most limited resources, but the consequence is that can you show how much something matters to you? without throwing money at it? Can you show someone how much you love them and how much you want to provide for them um, without spending a dime? It's it's challenging. Um, and I, I don't blame people who get stuck in a loop of thinking that, well, um, my child or my partner or my family or my dog deserves the very best in life. I just bought an 80 pound bag of dog food. It was so expensive. And my old dog who I bought it for to try to put weight on him, he won't eat it. So you know what? <laughs> screw all these. Screw all these hangers on. Len does the same thing for the yourself. squirrels. He, he, <laughs> he, he, he takes the acorns and spreads peanut butter on every single one. He's like, I'm they, do get, they do get special treats. They'll get an avocado. Sometimes we'll throw a little pecan in with wow. the walnuts. Uh, they like uh, some of them like bread. Some, you know, the really the nice French bread. They enjoy in it. about <laughs> six weeks from now. We're going to hear this story on Len's blog about how the squirrels got into the <laughs> attic. They ruined all the. They ruined <laughs> nah, all the. Let squirrels, the squirrels eat better than it's I do. It's warm enough here. The squirrels don't even bother. Your avocado toast feasting squirrels. <laughs> yeah. My God, right. they're going to rise up against you. You better be careful. Let's bougie gonna, squirrels in the backyard. Know, lattes. Uh, so, so Kitty, I love where you took that also, and that's not where I took it either. Uh, Len, Len, how about you? What did you well, think when you saw this? Well, to me, it's it's uh, you know it's when you allow money to. It, to be a drug for you um and um you kind of abuse money and and by most people abuse money by spending up to their income level so and then you get on that hamster wheel where you're you're you continually want more and you have to strive to make more and more and more and more just to keep pace so uh, to me it's 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 um you know you know it's like any drug i mean they have that it's a great thing in small quantities, but if you owe, if you abuse it, it can end up being very addictive and it can actually backfire on you. So the quest for more money um, and, and it comes down really to self um, uh, self restraint. Um, I mean, there comes a point uh, like I remember when I was younger, I had a goal in my I remember when I first started work, I said, well, I want to make X salary. You know, if I can get to that number, I'm going to be perfectly fine. I mean, life's going to be great. And usually that that works as long as you're willing to once you get to that X number, you you don't continue. I mean, you spend way below your means. You live below your means and don't expand your spending to get to that number, because if you continually expand your spending to match whatever your your salary increase is or your income, whatever it is, um, that that tends to it kind of increases that hunger, that that drive for more money. Uh, and forces you to probably work harder than you really want should be working to be healthy anyways i got this i got this much and now i got this raise and so if i get the next raise then i can buy x and then you're in this buy cycle loop yeah and you have to continually keep getting raises right to continue and if you don't uh it's you're really up a creek too so um it's the beginning yeah. of the rat race right yep, there yep that's the beginning of the rat race still not not what i was thinking oh gee mm. oh gee how about you it's like a competition to try to read Joe's mind. No, actually, <laughs> it's not at all. I was like, I was going to go through. Why don't you just tell us what you're thinking instead of asking all of us? No, what popped in my head for this around ha having money control you was the uh, experience that we had in the pursuit of the all of the real estate that we owned. And I was thinking about this in a couple of contexts, both from the rental property standpoint of. I'm investing into passive income, which was a crap load of work to get a little bit of income. Now it paid off the, in the back end and the most no passive, passive investment you ever had. Yes. And, and, you know, and people talk about this stuff, like I retired when I'm 34 and I, with all this money and look how great I am. It's like, well, yeah, now you make 300 grand a year blogging. So, you know, you didn't really retire. You changed jobs, which is <laughs> wah, a different wah. way of saying it. <laughs> It, yeah, I want more people fine. to talk about that. It doesn't bother me, you know, but don't tell somebody you're retired. I, you know, 
I mean, that's fine. But my I, point is, I want is that, our blog to make three hundred grand. Can you hook us up with a? I know. Kind of yeah. Whatever that was. Yeah, exactly. Well, as soon as we, as Love soon as that. we figure out how to Kitty, do it. Kitty, here's well. what you do, and it, and it worked for me. I did just just get all your all your readers and tell them to click on every ad on your blog page, and I'm telling you. You can make a good chunk of those, change. Let us that actively, actively. Those nickels roll in. Click just here click to everything. support the blog. Just click everything. Click yeah. everything. He's link. got a banner on the top. His his website's called clickeverything.com. Yeah. Click everything. <laughs> Plenpenzo.com click, slash click, click here.info. I love it. <laughs> it's but we're in the play pers- a game today, everybody. <laughs> game Ooh, gets the most. Clicks. How many of these ads can you click in a minute? It's called pay my water bill. <laughs> Here's how it works. Reminded me of the guy that sold a website for had had a million pixels. It was it was yes. a, what, yeah. a ten thousand by ten thousand, and you could you could buy each pixel with your brand for a dollar. And yeah. so people were buying you know five pixels and ten pixels until he filled it all up and he had a million dollars. Yes, he did. Yeah. From one, oh my god. One thing. Um, but anyways, this whole pursuit of like passive income with rental properties was at anything but it was like this huge expense of time this huge expense of 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 money and capital to to uh, uh, allegedly free myself up from having to work for money and it was like well that didn't work you know because i spent so much time and energy trying to do all the time and energy as opposed to you know the actual passive thing or another great example is you know you buy a lake house or something like that and and you're like i have just done this great thing and what do you do you spent you have to go work back to lens point uh you have to go work to afford the lake house that you can no longer i think kitty was talking about this too that you can no longer go to because you have to work to afford Mm -hmm. the lake house but you're now working extra time that you couldn't do it's just like this weird cycle of of more which you know, is, is really bizarre. So I don't know, Joe, was that what you were thinking about? Or were that you was, thinking about that something was not completely what I was different? <laughs> that was maybe well, the we're closest to what I was thinking. Yes. And we're out of time. Wait, do and... I get a turn? Yes. I absolutely. think I know what Joe is thinking. It doesn't matter what Save I was us, thinking. Save us, Diana. I'm loving Save what all us. you guys were thinking. I don't, if, if anybody's wondering, I don't care what I was thinking. I'll, I will tell you what I was thinking, but it doesn't matter. These are, it's, inc- it's incredible though. I think what we're getting is the number of ways money can control you because all those were different and money can control you in so many different ways and uh diana yeah well what i thought of this point of your money could own you is when you buy a bunch of luxurious expensive things now you take on you know you need to maintain them you need to protect them that's what i was thinking right there so like i think about you know (laughs) shortly after i bought my house six years ago we had some um a bunch of break-ins in the neighborhood it ended up being like some young kids that were just like stealing electronics and a lot of my neighbors went and like got expensive security systems we got to protect our stuff you know and i remember talking to my neighbors about it and then looking around my house and being like what are they gonna take the toaster you know (laughs) like i don't i don't have anything of real value that i'm like worried about anyone taking and i actually think there's a lot of freedom in that if I had a bunch of like expensive things, now I got to worry about protecting them and, you know, buying even more stuff to protect my expensive stuff. That's like drive a beater car, drive a, drive a beater car and you, you can uh, have keep the windows down wherever you go. You don't have to lock the car, nothing. Just get right to wherever you're going. It's awesome. No insurance. It's beautiful. Just print steal me on the side. I don't know if you heard what Kitty said, but you have Buddy, uh, who is the most irreplaceable, valuable thing in the world. So, and the uh, first thing I'd steal in your home, to be honest, (laughs) I'd just be like, "Come here, Buddy! Come here, Buddy! Have this (laughs) T-bone." He would like welcome you in and show you where where his most prized possessions are. (laughs) That's true. Oh, thank you for this raggedy old chew toy. Thank you, Buddy. He'd actually escort you right over to the toaster and say, "Please take it." (laughs) Right. No, what I was thinking, Diana, very similarly, I immediately thought of this uh, Henry David Thoreau quote, which I had to pull up so that I get the exact fancy Thoreau uh, flex here. Uh, The cost of a thing is the amount of what I will call life, which is required to be exchanged for it immediately or in the long run. And I don't know what, what age I was, but I finally realized that everything that I bought, more stuff that I bought meant either it would sit in a corner doing nothing 
and it does nothing for me. So then why do I buy it? Or I'm going to actually spend time with it, doing something with it. And then I'm actually spending this currency, which I have finite amount of, which is time. I can get more money. I can't get more time. And so for me, that's how money and, and, you know, ended up using me, which was, but it was amazing. All these, all these different ways that we could, uh, we could be used by, by cash. Thanks for throwing that out there, by the way. <laughs> oh. I was sitting on it. I was sitting on it. I was sitting on it. <laughs> Once Didn't hear again, a word you said. We're so excited for my pun. Applications for Kobich. Uh, <laughs> we'll be replacing Kitty. And there it goes. <laughs> uh, we're going to come back to this, and maybe we'll get through two more of these 13 in the second half. But at the halfway point of every Stacking Benjamins Friday roundtable episode, we have this epic competition between our three frequent contributors, Len Penzo, OG, and Paula Pant. And today, Kitty and Piggy, as we said earlier, you are Team Paula, which means, Kitty, there's good news and bad news. Do you want the good news first or the bad news? Oh, the bad news. Well, the bad news is, is that Paula is doing what she does every stinking year in this competition, which is she's in last place. Uh, I, you did not have to tell me that. I love <laughs> Paula so much. And part of my love for her is knowing she is coming in last place in, in a trivia contest. At Always. No yeah. surprise there. I think Remember her brain time? is full of all the big stuff. It, doesn't it really is. Remember that time she like was going to present on a stage in front of like 500 people at a economy conference and she only shaved one of her legs and had to go running back to her hotel moment. to shave in, her other leg? My God, I was like, I, I've I was never related to more to a public figure. I, I was right. I was like, like that celebrities. Hairy? They're Could just you like actually me. see the hairy, the non saved leg from the the audience. Len, it was that we hairy. declined hairy. comment. We that declined hairy comment. Leg. <laughs> I don't think we'll my get, legs are that hairy. We'll get that for Paula next week. <laughs> Eat your Wheaties. <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, OG wasn't live with us that day. Um, he said it was because he missed his flight. True story is he didn't shave his left leg. That was. Oh, no. Oh, gee. Exactly it happens to the best happened. of us. Yes, that's what really happened. But anyway, Paula has one so far this year. OG has two. And our reigning champion, Len, has three. Which the good news then, Kitty, is that you and Piggy get to go last because you're in okay. last place. OG's going to guess second. Paul, uh, Len guesses first. But we need a trivia question, and that's where Diana comes in. Diana, what are we guessing today? Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's cousin, Diana. On this day in 1921, actor Alan Hale, who, was, who played the beloved skipper on Gilligan's Island, was born in Los Angeles to two actors. Hale's parents were both successful, appearing in a combined 300 plus films, mostly silent. Now those are lines I could remember no problem. Gilligan's Island, my dream life. Just a group of friends laying around on the beach all day with nothing to worry about. What an easy life. As much as my family would miss me if I was stranded on an island, it would be nice for me to not have to pay bills for a while. Plus, I'd still be earning on my investments. Do you think the credit card companies would give up on you, Diana, if you're on, the, if you're on Gilligan's Island? They might. Like at some point they're like, this was a this was a three hour tour. This is a three hour question. Let me get through it, Joe. <laughs> Sally May, Sally May would probably find you on Gilligan's uh, Yeah, Island I think that's now. how you get rescued from the island. Is Sally May would come <laughs> find you? <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly. How. But that was before the student loan crisis. Diana, continue. But I don't have debt. I'd still be earning on my investments. A steady income with no bills. Sign me up. If Mr. Howell, the most financially savvy of the castaways, had invested $1,000 in the stock market on the day before they set sail, September 26, 1964, he would have come back to a nice chunk of money. Assuming a return of 8% and of course no additional contributions, it would have been worth $3,172.17 on the day they were rescued. Today's trivia question is, how many days were the castaways stranded on Gilligan's Island? I'll be right back after I find my Swiss Army knife and flares. Jeans, that is. Of course. You gotta have your flare jeans if it's 19. Oh my god. Yeah. Well, no, they're what back. Was the interest they're rate? back. 8%. They're right back. 8%. Is the interest okay. rate. 
Okay. Are uh, we allowed to use calculators? Uh, nope. Uh, the calculator in your brain you get to use. Len, it's been broken it? since I, I used it to write <laughs> boobs in eighth grade. <laughs> the question is how long the question is how long were they on the island before they were rescued? How right? many how many There's... days? Eight percent rate of return. Mr. Howell starts with a thousand, he's got three thousand well, seven hundred what? Wait a minute. Twenty eight dollars. Well, what's that got to what's the per rate of return have to do with how long it's been since they were rescued? How many days they were until but, they were because rescued? Because on the day in. he was rescued it was worth three thousand how much was it, Diana? I don't remember. Three thousand one hundred and seventy two dollars and seventeen cents. So started with a thousand, got over three thousand, eight percent return. Okay. How many days right. did it so, take to so, get there? All right. So okay. So so you're if I wanna if I wanna do the math, I can work in reverse and, and figure it out. I have no freaking clue. Um so this is basically do this is basically are you asking what is your end point for uh, how many days when they were rescued? Days? Is it is it how many days, how many days the show days? ran, or from the day the first premiere to the to the last? No, day? Hypo many days hypothetically, on the island. Hypothetically, and the, it's in the storyline. They were they were uh, marooned I'm sorry, for I fell asleep in the middle of. That thing. <laughs> it was so long, Len. I agree. We were distracted and by the cut it down, by the way. It was the squirrels. They distracted it. All right, leave them alone. Let me write this down. Eight percent return. It, it, it started with a thousand, and they ended with what? Three thousand one hundred seventy-two and seventeen cents. Wait, 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 wait. He's writing it down. I don't know if that's allowed. Oh, it's, 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 it's a math problem now. Yeah, uh, but I, I can't use a calculator. Listen, uh, okay. I haven't done paper. Violates return. the spirit of the treaty, I believe. Right. Yeah, I, yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> I tend to agree, Lud. Okay. Uh, Eight percent return. A thousand dollars. You finish with three thousand one hundred seventy-two. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm going to have to be quiet about how I'm doing this because if I say how I'm doing this, then everybody else is going to be. Uh, I'm going to say uh, uh, um, so uh, what is okay? I, I I'll, I'll talk it out. Rule of this 72. is riveting radio, rule of 72. by the way. Yeah. Is it, yeah. Rule of seventy two: your investment doubles. Uh, 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 if it's eight percent return, eight divided by seventy-two is what? Uh, thir thirteen, 13 years. So uh, nine years, nine years. So I double it nine, and then another <laughs> another nice half, trilogy. another half. <laughs> double it nine, and another half is thirteen. I'm going to say uh, just thirteen years. Well, you got to give us days. The question is days. 13 years times 365. Can somebody <laughs> please do the math? So please put light out of his business. And it doesn't matter because these guys are going to sandwich me. So I did all the work. Promises, promises, uh, 15, huh? 15, uh, 19, uh, 1,000, and then uh, 365. Yes. And so that's uh, 4,765 days. 4,765 OG, what do you think of that number? What was what was Len's number? <laughs> we know what he's going to do. 4765. 4765. Uh, so in case you don't know, the right way to play this is one of us picks the higher number, one yes. of us picks the lower. Yep. And especially with this, we just kind of, you know, we got you. We got you. Uh, do you guys have a preference? Would you prefer the over or the under? I'd really love the over, please. If Great. That's I'll take right. the Thank you. I'm Perfect. looking out for Paula. I'll take the under. So whatever that's, lens was I'm more of an I low. love Lucy person. That is, that so this is, is a big challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Sucks to suck, Len. The last time I thought about Gilligan's Island was when I was like in a college literature course and I realized that you could sing all of the poems of Emily Dickinson to the Gilligan's Island theme. <laughs> that's true. Uh, yeah. I dwelt in possibility, a fairer house than prose, more numerous for windows, superior for doors. Superior Art school, guys, it's a doors. steal. Only $45,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so OG, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need you to say a number. What is your number then? My number is one less than lens. One what less it? than lens. Okay. Yes. Forty-seven sixty-four. Sixty-four. Yes. Sure, sounds great. And the bitches take forty-seven sixty-six. I'm hearing. Yes, yes, that is correct. And Len's shaking his head. What's wrong? With <laughs> I'm just wondering why I was even part of this question since I, I have no. Uh, this this is. Uh, I, I, Thank I, you for I, your I, sacrifice. <laughs> 
we've got Len Penzo locked in like a say we got a Penzo sandwich going on in mom's basement. Love to tell you who is uh, going to get this one right. Might not be Len, but we'll be right back. <laughs> you don't be think. Len, you kicked this off by saying 4,765. How are you feeling about that, guys? Well, you mean I did all the work is what you're saying. <laughs> yes, I did all well, the work. Well, you're saying you, you, you probably nailed it, though. So if you did the if well, it's a math problem, then you nailed it. No, it's not. It it's not quite. There, it, it, I'm okay. off by some small amount. So, and, and is it up or down? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I'm bitter. I'm bitter. Ooh. OG in this sandwich, you took the bottom. You like being on the bottom? Uh, I took the under because I was a scholar and a gentleman, and asked <laughs> uh, the bitches if they would prefer the over. Uh, which I actually think is the answer. I think I think the answer was greater than 13 years. I don't know why, but that's well. Remember uh, the rule piggy? of 72. The rule of 72 is actually the rule of 69. So I I I, I kind of uh, <laughs> probably also known as the rule Speaking of 420. Of sandwiches. That's right. Kind yeah. of, sort of. Just too too far. <laughs> too Kitty piggy sandwiches. feeling confident? You getting Paula back in this race? I'm feeling you know, very confident. As as far as expertise in vintage shows about being trapped on stranded islands, we are likely a bit stronger on our lost. However, we're feeling yes. really good. We're ready to represent. Yeah. Good one. Yeah. But, but can confident. you do Emily Dickinson to the lost theme? I don't think so. The lost theme no. is just, it's just <laughs> it's a <laughs> 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 Yes. By the way, wasn't lost? Again, wasn't so... that kind of anticlimactic? The the whole ending. You you went. They strung us out for like seven years, and then I know. the end was. Like, I waited That's like it. five years to watch yeah. the last season, and by the time I watched it, I was like, okay, this is this is adequate. This does the job. But at the time, oh. I was too angry to watch it. <laughs> oh, Piggy, when I heard uh, an interview, maybe in season three with the writers, and the writers were like, "Yeah, we don't even know where it's going." Exactly. I'm like, I'm not yeah, investing didn't. time. Yeah. In this. Like, like yeah, you yeah. don't know where it's going. Well, yeah, I, I figured out they were making lost. it up near the end. <laughs> I yeah, it's no Babylon Five because it was in a movie. It was like it was like in um, This Is Forty that that funny kind of <laughs> comedy movie with Paul. Uh, what's his name? Paul Rudd. Rudd and um, and the daughter was watching it and she found out how it ended and was just <laughs> apoplectic over the ending. So just um, watch, uh, just watch. We are forty. And you'll get it. This Speaking of that, funny. we're going to be 40 years older when we get to the answer to this. <laughs> Diana, who's, who's going to win this Thanks, thing? Diana. Hey there, stackers. I'm survivalist and bitch who do well on dates, even on a yeah. deserted island. Joe's mom's cousin, Diana. During the break, I applied to be a contestant on the show Survivor. It was a long they break. You had plenty of time. <laughs> They ask you all kinds of personal questions, like your birthday, your height, your weight. There's a good chance that, like Doug often does, they'll think I'm lying about my dimensions and throw out my application. If I don't hear from them, I'll know what happened. Some people just can't accept perfection. No. Today's <laughs> trivia question is, how many days were the castaways stranded on Gilligan's Island? The answer? The close-knit group of seven included the professor, who was a science teacher. During their time on the island, he built a number of things, including a washing machine, an electric generator, and a lie detector test. An odd collection of things to spend time on when he could have been fixing the boat. <laughs> Accounting for leap years, he would have been able to work on it for either 5,478 or 5,479 days. Now, I thought it was so interesting watching Len do these calculations because I knew the answer. And he sounded like he really, like the math was mathing until he gave me his answer, which is 714 days under the actual answer, which means that the bitches are our winners. Woo! Yay. I'm You're welcome, Paula. Where is the music? Here it is. Nice job, ladies. Thank you. Good work. Thank you. Thank you. We would like to thank Len um, for bothering to do a little bit of math in his head. Uh, and we would like to thank OG for letting us choose the over or the under. We truly couldn't have done it without both of you. But really, uh, we think Paula has us to thank. For yeah, we her, definitely uh, could win. not have win except that you two both lost. Yeah. <laughs> nice. You know, as the bastards that we are... OG, we really, uh, we, we really, why did we do that? We fought each other and look what happened. 
We let the bitches win. That's, the that's, bitches oh, no. win. That's the name of my the bitches always win. strategy <laughs> for 2024. <laughs> it's either me or not Len. Those are my two options. Well, and I would like to, uh, uh, Piggy, to add to your thanks. I'd like to thank depositaccounts.com for waiting forever until I mentioned their brand. <laughs> so we finally made it to the second part of this show. Uh, uh, Kitty, you know what happens when you go to depositaccounts.com? You're uh, probably going to get a better experience than having um, yep. everything made out of coconuts. Slightly better. You can compare more than 275,000 deposit rates from over 11,000 banks and credit unions for free. Pinch me. Uh, if you go just to depositaccounts.com, you'll see the current rates on savings accounts, CDs, checking, and money markets. And get this, the national average, as you're reading this, check this out the day that you hear this because we're recording a little early. National average on a savings rate, point. It's 0.51%. Uh, Top uh, one. Uh, 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 0.53%. It went up while we were doing this last trivia thing. <laughs> because it took us so long. <laughs> uh, the top 1% is 4.98% if you're in the top 1%. So that brick and mortar bank might not be doing all it can. Head to depositaccounts.com to compare, ditch, switch, and save. All right, let's uh, let's go over some of these. We we covered two of them. Uh, which Perfect. one really spoke to you, uh, Kitty? Why don't you kick us off? Could someone with their screen closer to their bodies read the bit about um, how someone's psychological wounds can influence how they spend their money? Me too. Uh, this is how you spend money can be a reflection of what you've experienced in life. Yes. So someone who grew up snubbed by poverty, owning a fancy car might be the ultimate symbol of what you've overcome. To an old money family, it might be the ultimate symbol of ego and insecurity. People don't just spend money on things they find fun or useful. Their decisions often reflect their psychological wounds of their life experiences. Kitty, this is so true. Absolutely. I think you cannot just like snap your fingers and, oh, I have an abundance mindset now, even though I, I grew up without enough food to go around. Um, and so much of the money spending behavior that we can see in people that looks so illogical, it it has its own logic. They're not just being like sort of like I'm the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland. I'm wacky for no reason. Um, instead, they they are doing something that makes sense if you could view it within the context of their entire life and how they grew up and what they value and what was denied to them um, at formative times in their life. So that one really touches me because I think we we always touch on the fact that like personal finance is personal. What matters to one person is not even a, a remote priority to another um, but like wounds, the wounds that someone carries is, is a really interesting way to put it. It's funny when you talk about looking from the outside in somebody's expenses, you know, you might, you might think they're crazy the way they spend money. I love somebody we had an expert on recently who had a great point when they said that um, instead of leading with that stupid lead with if you're going to say something at all to someone say say how did how did you how did you start there like like what happened and th this person said there's always a story behind it kitty there's always a story and once you know the story you get this whole different perspective you didn't have before you asked that question absolutely yeah uh, uh diana it's it's interesting because i'm thinking about some of the speakers you've had on the stage at economy and some of their <laughs> stories like money is so often much more psychological <laughs> and much less i don't know fact-based or much you know <laughs> practical than we think it is oh yeah i mean i think about just because you have money does it mean that you are enjoying the emotional benefits of having money like I think about even Carl Jensen on the economy stage, and we've all heard that historic interview that he did with Ramit where, you know, him and Mindy are what sitting on $4 million and they have trouble spending it. And I think that there, there can be a tendency when you have financial goals to be overly fixated on those goals. Um, but the, the goal isn't to sit on a pile of money. The goal is to use money as a tool to build a life focused on what actually matters. But money d isn't what actually matters. But it's almost like you have to get a bunch of money before you can realize that. And I feel like I'm in this community where I'm surrounded by millionaires who look up at their net worth 
and all they feel is fear. And it's kind of it's madness. You know, I think we we have to start enjoying the um, security that can come from having a financial safety net. But we got to go use that money to do stuff. We can't just sit on a pile of it. Yeah, because while you're sitting on that pile of it, you're wasting again that commodity that we can't get back the 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 time. Piggy, which one of these spoke to you? Well, first off, I want to say don't like speak for yourself when you say you can't sit on a pile of money because I can sit on a lot of things. <laughs> My butt is wide and flat and Italian. I can I sit really on to, some Joe. money. <laughs> <laughs> like like a bird on a nest. Uh, no, I the one that really spoke to me was near the bottom where Morgan Housel says there's no such thing as an objective level of wealth. Everything is relative to someone else. Um, and I, I really feel like that that speaks to me because I wrote a piece years ago about the subjectivity of expensiveness and how to some people things are really expensive and to other people they're really not expensive based on your net worth how much income you make etc etc and i feel like they're the the same thing applies to wealth and i think that a lot of folks have a bad habit of only looking up when comparing and not looking down and what i mean by that is if you uh, are evaluating yourself by other people, very often you're like, oh my gosh, well, I'm going to look at this person over here who has a really nice car, a really big house, like they can afford a cleaner, they they can afford nice haircuts, and they're not looking at the person below them on the great staircase of financial inequality and going, oh, well, I can afford things that this person can't. So there's the objectivity of, of wealth is non-existent because to the person below you, you have you are quite wealthy, but to the person, but to you, you know, you're not looking below, you're comparing yourself to people above. So you might be like, ah, I'm not wealthy. I can't afford my house being cleaned four times a month. Can you tell that like my house needs to be cleaned? Um, I, 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 that really spoke to me because again, I, I need to look at the, you know, the mother of twins panhandling in the grocery store parking lot when I'm feeling down on my luck and not the person who, lives in my neighborhood and has an immaculately manicured lawn in a much larger house. Well, and this is, this is OG, uh, what, what strategic coach OG and I both get coaching from this group called strategic coach. They caution us on because people, people as explained by strategic coach OG, they keep, they keep moving the, moving the goalpost, right? I mean, if you don't sit and, and stop comparing yourself and just look at what you've accomplished, you'll always move the goalposts. Mm -hmm. Well said. I think it's important to, you know, continually work on yourself. And sometimes that means having higher aspirational goals, but by the same token, there's some limit of, of enough, you know, when it comes to it's just generally stuff. And, you know, we work with a lot of clients on long-term financial planning and Len was trying to do some math in his head about the power of compounding and it's really profound it's it we just can't do it in our heads to to forecast if i save this money for this you know my entire lifetime how much money will i have and you do the just an excel worksheet and you see oh it says i'm going to have 25 million dollars if i do this or you know some big number and my contention along the along the way with all this is that you'll never see that because hopefully someone in your corner whether that's somebody like us or other people around you will go like hold on time out you don't need to die with 25 million dollars like it's cool to build the hospital now like <laughs> like do this do it now like have have the fun or have the experiences or make the difference or do whatever is important to you right now while while you're able to enjoy that, while you're able to see the benefits of it. Uh, there's a very popular book, The Die With Zero book, and we were just talking about this with a client a little bit ago. I don't particularly like the idea of dying with zero. That's a gamble that I don't want to take. Plus, I think that we get the benefit of time. And and why would I want to rob my kids of the fact that I had 90 or 100 years to save money ahead of them? And like, to give them that power of compounding that I took the first hundred years on. I think that's a great gift, but that's, I don't think that's the message of it. I don't think the message is like literally die with zero. It's like, try to make it a, an impact on the things that are important to you while they can be important to the people that you're trying to make an impact on. You know, if you go out and ask the, 
uh, make a wish people, would you rather have $10 million in 50 years from now, or would you rather have my $10,000 contribution today? Every day of the week, they'll say, give us the 10,000 today because we've got a kid right now we can send to Disney World. Yeah. yeah and 10 million in in 100 years would probably be great too but but we've got kids now that need to you probably won't be able to it. get into disneyland for 10 million dollars 50 years <laughs> <You're from> probably <laughs> right if you've been there recently Two weeks i can now. attest i can attest to the fact that uh, that it's gone up so um you know so that's 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 how i think about a lot of this stuff is it's not a it's not a either or it's a this is a continuum of decision making and all of this stuff kind of resonates you know, resonates with, with, I think people who are thinking about financial planning the right way. What's interesting. The thing that I think about as I think about, Oh gee, what you said and, and to what the, the, the piece that you brought up and this piece piggy is, you know, that old kind of trite phrase that comparison is the thief of joy, but it also is the thief of what makes us different and how it is this personal journey. Like you talked about OG earlier that, you know, for you uh, buying individual properties was horrible for my son. It's a hundred percent what he'd rather do and would rather do nothing else owns these rental yeah. properties and he's going to actively buy more. He doesn't think of it as passive quote passive income. I think that's kind of laughable, but he, but he certainly thinks of it as his path to financial independence. And it's that's, that's why I think it's so important to recognize that everybody is in a different place and can be successful in different things. You know, there's, there's, all, especially when it comes to money, there's so many different paths to financial independence or, or, you know, financial stability or whatever the case may be. Some people take one path and then we've got to be careful to not be on that on one side and go, well, that side's stupid. It's like, well, no, there's plenty of people who are fabulously wealthy buying real estate. And some people are really great with trading, you know, day trading penny stocks. I mean, it's not what I would do. It doesn't make my way good and their way bad. It's it's um, it's what's good for you in the in the in the skill set that you have, the capacity that you have to to get better at whatever it is that you're that you're working on. So Len, give us one more. You know, the one that resonated with me was the unspent money by something intangible but valuable. He says freedom, independence, uh, autonomy, and control over your time. This is his writing. It says every dollar of savings buys a claim check on the future. I like – that's one way to look at it. I like the reverse way of looking at it, and that is uh, when you're spending money that you don't have – you're actually buying into indentured servitude. So you're actually uh, limiting your choices in life. So, uh, you know, look at, look at it that way. That's less choices when you're borrowing, more choices when you're saving. Um, that being said, if you have to borrow, make sure you always borrow from a pessimist. <laughs> why, why? Because, well, because they, they never expect the money you to pay it back so or or borrow, borrow from uh from from paula pan didn't paula say when she loans you money it's a gift so i immediately yeah. asked her for five grand you should have heard i mean that didn't happen i was kind of i'm like come on paula it's amazing kitty when you go and buy something do you think about it in lens terms do you think about it of of i'm 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 getting rid of freedom i'm exchanging this purchase for freedom tomorrow I have never thought of money any other way. Um, I remember very vividly that my very first job was as a camp counselor uh, for a kid's summer camp. And I had to wake up at five in the morning to be at the camp by six. And there was only one place in our tiny, tiny town that was open at that time, which was Krispy Kreme. So me and all of my coworkers would converge at the Krispy Kreme at the same time at the crack of dawn. Um, and, uh, not to date myself, but this means that I would have been making six twenty five an hour, um, would have been the minimum wage at the time. And when I would buy a donut and a coffee, it was almost six twenty five. And so every morning I went in knowing that I just spent my first hour, uh, of labor 
just to feed myself enough to get up the energy to chase these horrible children. You, um, you know what, though, so Kitty? That's, have... That is a great way of teaching kids about the value of money as well. I've, I've yeah. always, I still do that with, the, with my kids, even though they're growing up. But I've always done that. So it, it's going to take you two hours now to make, you know, of work to buy what you, to pay for what you just bought. And it, that seems to really sink in with kids. So I, that's uh, great. Well, but I was going to say, Kitty, working at a at a summer camp for kids, no wonder you chose something that's like 90% sugar just to give yourself the energy to chase those kids around. They were coming for me on the four square court, and I needed to defend my status as the king. So I really needed, I needed everything I, I could get. Children are a blessing. Back then, Kitty's blog was called <laughs> Bitches Get Stitches. True that's story. right. Yes. Well, Come for me. Yep. You're going to find out. What asphalt feels like on your face. <laughs> I think that's a great place to leave it. Don't come for Kitty. There it is. We're going to finish right there. Let's find out what's happening where all of you are at. We'll have our guest of honor go last. So, oh, gee, what you got going on this weekend? Uh, this week is leading into spring break. So my oldest actually tomorrow is uh, taking his SATs and then, Ooh. Uh, and then they're going to go. They're going to go to, uh, they're going to go skiing for a couple of days. I got to stay home cause I've got real work to do, but, but, uh, oh shucks. I have the house to myself. Well, it really <laughs> bums me out bummer. that I'm not going to be able to hang Boy, out with my thing. family for a week. <laughs> bummer. But, um, uh, yeah. So that's what's going on. A, a quiet week around the OG house. Fabulous. Len, what's going on at lenpenzo.com, man. You know, every once in a while, I do have something useful on the on the blog. And this this week, uh, we talk about there's actually an allocation that's been uh, a portfolio allocation, not the sixty forty, but there's one out there that uh, with a mix of four different assets. Some people call it the perfect portfolio uh, diversification scheme. So, uh, what are those four assets? Stop by lenpenzo.com and you'll find Ooh. out. But they but the returns over a hundred year period. Uh, have been the proof is in the pudding, uh, and they've done very well. Actually, better than the sixty forty uh, asset. Allocation. Wait a minute. So, so stop on by. I think I got them, Len. You do. Lottery tickets, cigarettes, and I don't have the other two. Candy, candy cane, candy corns, hookers, and blow. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't reveal the other two, Joe. But oh, and one last thing is when you do stop by, please click on those ads. Uh, mole two or three at least uh, would be very helpful to me as a retired person. It's so, a fun game you. for the whole family. Get the whole family over there. <laughs> Just click everything. Yes. Oh, uh, Kitty and Piggy, so glad you guys spent time with us again. That was so fun. Thanks for hanging out. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. So what's happening at Bitches Get Riches? I just spent some time, uh, uh, maybe a week ago, going through all the different ways to pay down debt that you had, the snowball method, and the and the uh, and I and I. By the way, any time that you can put poetry in there, and uh, and rag on uh, Mr. Ramsey a little bit and have some fun, that was a good time. Thank you very much. And you can you can enjoy more of that at bitchesgetriches.com at any time. You can find all of our social media there. Um, but no, we have kind of something exciting that I mentioned earlier. Um, this month, we are launching our burnout course. Um, it is incredible. It is a two-hour uh, video and 75-page workbook with practical, actionable uh, exercises and advice on how to identify, manage, and heal from burnout, um, specifically career burnout, though we do talk about interpersonal burnout and caregiving burnout as well. Um, and people can check that out at our website, bitchesgetriches.com slash courses. Anything else to say about that, Kitty? Uh, you're leaving out the most important thing, which is that it's very funny. Oh, it is so funny. It's the funniest. It is the funniest. I wrote it at 3 a.m. and I think it's hilarious. <laughs> and I edited it so that it actually is. <laughs> betrayal. Just Top kidding. 10 you're anime betrayal. You're very, you're very funny, dear. Thank you. I love I that. I love you I, and I, I show it without money. <laughs> I'm just imagining Kitty waking up at like 6.30 next to her laptop with the vodka spilled over. And she's like, was that a fever dream or was I brilliant? And she looks <laughs> at the words on the screen and goes, nope, it was brilliant. The closer we get to dawn, the more confident I become in all of my jokes. <laughs> 
which confidence is everything, especially in writing. Yeah, oh, especially. Absolutely. Yes. Awesome. And we will link to that. It's at, at bitchesgetriches.com slash courses. All right. We'll link to that. We'll link to Mr. Penzo's four asset classes, which may or may not include cigarettes and lottery tickets. Uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us today. Diana, you've got the last word here. What uh, what should be on our to-do list? So what's stacked up on our to-do list for today? First, take some advice from the bitches and don't let your financial goals lead to burnout. It's just not worth it. Second, as our headline today pointed out, there's no such thing as an objective level of wealth. So stop comparing yourself to the Kardashians and look how far you've come. But what's the biggest to do? I'm going to invest $1,000 in the stock market today, just in case I find myself stranded on an island one day. That way, I'll have enough to retire to a different island after I'm rescued. You can find out more about Piggy and Kitty at BitchesGetRiches.com. We'll also include links in our show notes at StackingBenjamins.com. Thanks to Len Penzo for joining us today. You can find Len at LenPenzo.com. Are you looking for more fun? Join me and a ton of other money nerds at the Economy Conference next weekend. If you hurry, you still might be able to get in before we sell out. Head to economyconference.com and use Stacking Benjamins, one word, for a 10% discount. Thanks also to OG for joining us today. Looking for good financial planning help? Head to stackingbenjamins.com slash OG for his calendar. The show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2024, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show is written by Lisa Curry, who's also the host of the Long Story Long podcast, with help from me, Joe, Kate Yonkin, Karen Repine, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Wonder how beautiful we all are? Of course you do, but you'll never know if you don't check out our YouTube version of the show, engineered by Tina Eichenberg. Then you'll see once and for all that I'm the best thing going for this podcast. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude, Stacy Doe, and Julia Garib are our social media coordinators. And Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. For more interactive fun, join us on Instagram every Tuesday and Thursday for our Instagram Lives. Kate Yonkin and Joe host those weekly. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. Boy, am I glad our lawyer made us say that. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show.